Hello. I want to show you how privacy preserving contact tracing works. Um, before we go into it, at the time I'm making this video here, um, I'm living in Austria, a country which is under a pretty rigorous lockdown due to COVID-19. And over the last couple of weeks, I uh, spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how um, to automate contact tracing um, with the help of mobile phones. And there have been various different developments that um, went down this path of implementing contact tracing uh, with mobile phone support. And one of the most uh, promising um, versions of that uh, is a decentralized protocol. And this is also um, what Apple and Google announced um, the last couple of days that they wanted to back. And so I want to explain a little bit how this works and to clarify some um, potential misconceptions that are floating around. Um, so first we need to figure out what we actually want to achieve. And what we want to achieve is we want to uh, significantly reduce the amount of time it takes to communicate infections. Um, so COVID-19 fundamentally um, has one of the problems, which is that it would appear that people are infectious even without knowing. Um, and that period of time is actually quite lengthy. So it doesn't just help us to isolate people that are already infectious. We need to figure out the ones which, um, which don't show symptoms yet. And so the idea is that um, if we have a bunch of people that are roaming the city, um, we want to communicate infections very quickly um, so that if one infected person met another person, we can... Uh, well, that person can automatically notify the, um, their contacts. And so normally this works um, through manual uh, contact tracing. So um, health officials go to an infected person, try to figure out where they were. Um, they, um, they will um, try to establish contacts manually. Um, and they also already have, from a legal perspective in most countries, quite a bit um, of, 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 of leverage. So specifically, um, you are, as an individual, generally not in a situation where you can opt out of this manual contract tracing. So you will have to cooperate already from a legal point of view. Um, and so this is already the environment in which we are. Um, and so the, the idea that a lot of people had, and specifically in Singapore, was to use smartphones to automate this process. Um, the first attempt of doing this um, that I was aware of is the Trace Together application from the Singaporean government. There's an open source version of that since they open sourced it, uh, which is called OpenTrace. The protocol underneath is called Blue Trace. And they all fundamentally, so this app and, and quite a few others that came out, they work um, through Bluetooth Low Energy. And fundamentally, they have a very strong centralized service, um, typically run by the health authorities, which can be used to exchange information. Um, this has up and downsides. But um, one of the more promising alternatives to this approach um, is called by the wider community um, uh, the temporary contact numbers protocol. Uh, the idea is that you exchange um, temporary contact numbers um, and then you compare later if, if any of those contact numbers that you exchanged um, show up on a list of infected uh, contacts. Um, the protocol that Apple and Google announced, um, which is what I'm going to explain in detail a little bit um, in this very short video, um, actually calls these temporary contact numbers rolling proximity identifiers, um, or RPI in brief. Um, and there's a very nice comic that explains the, the, the protocol, the, um, uh, the TCN-based protocol uh, from Nikki Case. And so I took some of the drawings um, to, to explain this. So the basic idea is that, um, that a person, uh, well, more specifically, a person's phone broadcasts these temporary contact numbers um, or rolling proximity identifiers every roughly 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, uh, or specifically whenever your Bluetooth device's MAC address changes, uh, you would uh, broadcast it another one. And other people around you, specifically their phones, can look for these numbers and just remember them and write them down. 
So um, the idea is that if an uh, infected person sits next to another person, their phone will already have automatically exchanged some con contact information. And these phones just remember these lists. So each phone remembers the stuff that it broadcasted. So all of the temporary contact numbers they broadcasted. And they also remember a list of all the temporary contact numbers um, that they encountered. Um, and so when someone feels sick and goes to the hospital and actually tests positive for COVID-19, they can take this list um, of, of uh, temporary contact numbers that they emitted, they broadcasted to others, and they can upload them to a centralized server. And this is the only part where centralization actually plays a role at all. And, um, and other phones can then look uh, and download this list and see if they found any of these contact numbers. And if there is a, an overlap, they can alert the user of this device. And now, obviously, this very simplistic protocol um, can't scale, right? Because like, if you get a new number every 10 minutes, and um, and everybody else does too, and you have to upload them to a central server and download them all. This is way too much data, um, and so this simplistic protocol wasn't wouldn't work. Um, but there are um, there are protocols that work better. So the one that got most traction until a couple of days ago was uh, is called DP3T. This is one of the submissions to the European PEPPT project, uh, a distributed tracing or maybe potentially distributed tracing um, consortium. Specifically, they have um, not decided on a protocol yet, but uh, DP3T was one of the submissions. And it's very similar to the protocol that Apple and Google announced. And so I'm actually only going to talk about the Apple Google version of it. But um, if, if you're interested in this, the DP3T white paper is actually very useful to understand some of the um, complexities associated with it and some of the potential attacks. So how does it work? Um, it's very simple. You have a tracing key, which is unique per device. You keep this for yourself. You never share it with anyone. Um, typically, um, this could be a 32-byte random number generated by a random number generator. And then every day, you derive a daily tracing key from this. Um, so every day, you get a different um, identifier. And this is memorized on your device. And since the infectious period is around 14 days, you would only have to store 14 of these derived tracing keys on your device. Um, you can also, with the algorithm proposed in the paper, only store the tracing key and remember the number of the date, because you can always get the same daily tracing key from the tracing key. Now, this daily tracing key stays with you. And for now, you don't share it. Um, but if you get infected, you would start sharing this key or, or the 14 keys that you want to expose. What you broadcast to other people, however, is, uh, is called the rolling proximity identifier. Uh, in DP3T, it's called the ephemeral ID. Um, in, in the wider open source community of people that also um, build protocols around this, this is to be called the temporary contact number. And other people store these uh, rolling uh, proximity identifiers but you don't have to upload them when, um, when you get infected, because when you get infected, you only have to upload the daily tracing keys. And other people download all of those um, daily tracing keys. And because of, the, uh, because of how this um, rolling proximity identifier is generated out of this, they can just generate them locally on the device. So basically, you generate all possibilities of them, and you match them locally on a device. And if you see there's an overlap, you can alert the user. Um, this is basically it. It's a very simple system. Um, but it has some implications. And some of those implications, I think, are quite interesting from a, uh, both from a legal perspective, but also from a, society, from a perspective of what this means for society. Um, so the, the most obvious implications are that the data really stays local on your device. and it really only ever gets shared anywhere at all if A, you are infected, and B, you choose to share it. So under the assumption that this um, is run in a country where government officials cannot force you to disclose this information, um, this data um, is free to you to choose uh, to share or not. Um, the second part is because conceptually this data can only be removed from the device or, or taken from the device for sharing um, 
in, in this case on infection, if the number of infections go down, the system also naturally scales down. Um, if we get to the point where there are no further COVID-19 infections, there will be no more data sharing going on. And then you're stuck with these uh, completely anonymous identifiers. Um, but it also has uh, some negative aspects to it. And, and these negative aspects, for what it's worth, are inherent to contact tracing. And so it's, I think, going to be interesting for us as a society to figure out how to deal with them. Um, some of those problems, however, they are um, solvable and they are not necessarily inherent to how the system works. So one of them, for instance, is um, at the moment, a lot of these tracing apps run into operating system limitations. Um, they want to use Bluetooth Flow Energy. Bluetooth Flow Energy um, can operate in kind of two modes. One of them is called the central mode, the other one's called the peripheral mode. And phones require, on iOS at least, the application to be in foreground for a phone to act as a peripheral. And so this, for instance, in Austria right now means that the Austrian Red Cross app, which is a form of a centralized um, tracing app, uh, cannot really participate. Um, cannot really make iOS users participate well in this, unless they chose to have the application run in foreground. Um, and this is why the the fact that I, uh, iOS, well, the fact that Apple and Google are now participating in this um, is very encouraging because this would mean that um, operating system APIs become available and potentially even uh, the tracing could work even without applications installed. The second part is that the usefulness of this um, increases um, with the number of participants. And there's, there's, a, there's a point where if the number of participants is too low, it's not useful at all. Um, how high that number has to be um, is, is quite disputed from what I've seen. Um, however, there are some misconceptions about it um, that are easy to um, address. So one of them, for instance, is that's particularly common in Austria, that a lot of people say that uh, old people who are in the risk group are less likely to have smartphones. And so um, that naturally means that this application doesn't work. Um, the counter argument to this is that is actually if everybody else other than old people were to use this, this would already help a lot because the people that old people, as particularly in care homes, are in contact with uh, would then have smartphones. And so if they test positive, then the, the manual contract tracing of the government will very easily spot the old people in, this, in the uh, old people's care home, for instance. And that were in contact with these. Um, however, now to the most critical part here, which is the, the the publicness of infections, and this is something that cannot be solved. Um, and the question here is, and I think this is going to be the part where we're going to spend most time on uh, going forward as we are evaluating the usefulness of these tracing apps is that everything is anonymous except for the infections. Um, so in most cases, um, you wouldn't likely know who of the people you met was COVID-19 positive. Um, however, there are various different ways in which you can scale this down. So the, the most innocent one is if you only met another person and you get an alert on your phone, um, that someone tested COVID-19 positive, well, then you already know that that was that person. However, inherent to the system, you could also start tracking the timestamps of when... So you could imagine you have a secondary app that works the same, that does the same as the normal um, so healthcare system provider tracing app, but it would record the exact timestamp of the infection and not just an approximate one. And then you could look at an individual... Um, rolling proximity identifiers, you can check each one of them against the database, and then you could figure out exactly at which second you met the person that was COVID-19 positive. And if you then use this data and you compare it, for instance, with your Google Maps location history, you could figure out exactly where you were at this point in time. Um, so you could get very close, even without too much work, to figure out where it happened that you got um, in contact with an infected person. Um, there are also more um, more contrived versions in which you can exploit this. 
Um, so one of them, for instance, could be that you deploy um, a smartphone that runs this app that also records the timestamps of all the contacts uh, near an office, for instance. And then this device could um, be connected also with the door opener, for instance. And then you could check every person that ever goes through the store if any of them eventually test COVID-19 positive. And then you could figure out which person that went to the office actually was COVID-19 positive. Um, so this is something that we don't really have a way to solve. Uh, because the, the natural behavior of this app is that you want to alert about infections. And so infections are public. There is nothing we can do about this. There are ways in which you could make the, um, uh, the this testing process, um, if, you, if you were to centralize it a little bit, you could uh, potentially detect somewhat abusive behavior uh, of people that test uh, a lot of different um, IDs. But for as long as the testing is done on the device, um, there's really nothing you can do to prevent this. And so when it comes to the, the worries that people have about this type of tracing apps, I think this is the part where there would have to be most conversation about. I don't really see us being able to solve this particular thing. Um, there are some attempts from the DP3T paper. There is um, a sort of probabilistic solution to this that uses cuckoo tables. Um, but realistically, if we want to deploy um, contact tracing apps and there are people that are worried about the privacy aspect of it, this is the one that should get the most focus. Um, the rest of the protocol is very simple and doesn't really cause any new problems that phones out of the box don't already pose. So um, it doesn't make phones easier to track specifically because all the data is local. Um, in fact, the the rotation of these temporary identifiers coincides with the rotation of the Bluetooth MAC addresses, which are already there. Um, so it doesn't even add more to it. Um, if you're on iOS, your phone is already emitting similar identifiers for the um, Find My iPhone support. So it doesn't add more to what's already there, um, but it does add this aspect of fundamentally sharing infections. And, and I think this really, again, is the part where we should be focusing on. Um, and this is my very basic introduction to uh, what this looks like. Um, I'm personally quite excited about the possibilities of this. Um, I believe that if we can convince people that this is a fundamentally good idea, and we can work on making this as privacy uh, preserving as possible, then we have a pretty good chance of actually returning back to a largely normal life. <laughs>